They learned from the Native Americans that the forest gave many things, along with the lakes and creeks. There have been artifacts found in and around Medicine Lake relating to the, the early Indian history here uh, of the area. For at least 20 to 25 years, every survey came back. The number one thing that people wanted was trails. Plymouth actually started as a platted community on the north side of Parker's Lake where Daniel Parker had his homestead. Chevy's store was the first business that I, I knew out that west of Minneapolis. We really need to keep changing and growing as our community changes. When the glaciers receded, they left soil that was very rich. A thousand years ago when the Native Americans, the woodland people were here, which were the ones that are given credit for the burial mounds, this was a big woods. It was a hardwood forest. Medicine Lake is kind of a confluence of three different land types in the area. It's kind of uh, the maple basswood forest is predominant, uh, so it had a lot of uh, maple basswood, oak type trees. It had some oak barrens area and some prairie grassland areas. They all kind of triangulated there at Medicine Lake. The topsoil was 12 to 24 inches deep from hundreds of years of leaves falling to the ground and decomposing. This was a lush, verdant land. The water was crystal clear and pure because the trees and the root system would protect the runoff. We know Medicine Lake was a very clear lake. It was spring fed. Medicine Lake had a kind of a rich uh, Indian history uh, originally. We do know that there were Indian burial mounds at Medicine Lake uh, located on the west shores of Medicine Lake. Um, there have been artifacts found in and around Medicine Lake relating to the, the early Indian history here uh, of the area. The first immigrants were basically either the fur trapper traders with French roots or the first pioneers that came were usually from New England. The settlers that came to Plymouth it came from a wide variety of countries in Europe um, and Canada. Joseph Nicollet was one of the early explorers in the area and uh, in his journals he recounts the Indian name for Medicine Lake and it would have been the, the Dakota name for Medicine Lake was Isapa Chagashtaka Bid and <laughs> that basically meant uh, where beavers uh, slapped their mouth in the manner of an Indian war cry. The true name, I think, is still Medicine Lake, as far as we know, and, and it's attributed to a story about an Indian being lost in a canoe out on Medicine Lake and his body never being found. And because of that, the, it was, the Indians considered, uh, uh, equated um, uh, a mystery with medicine. And so the name Medicine Lake kind of evolved from that point. There were two uh, early uh, boat businesses and rental businesses out on Medicine Lake. Um, one attributed to Antonin LeCount. Uh, Antonin LeCount was actually one of the first settlers of Plymouth. Uh, and he began renting boats as early as 1853 on Medicine Lake. Antoine LeCount homesteaded a piece of property on the east side of Medicine Lake and became the first recognized resident. He built a simple one-room log cabin there. But he stayed, married, had children, and the children who didn't survive much past infancy with the first burials in the St. Joseph Catholic Church's cemetery on County Road 9. The Parkers were a family in Maine. Um, Daniel Parker, who is considered the Parker that Parker's Lake is named for, his father was a preacher and farmer in Maine. They built the cabin on the north side of Parker's Lake. They helped establish the Parker's Lake Baptist Church, and so they became a, an important part of the community and they attached their name to the lake, and it stayed. Plymouth actually started as a platted community on the north side of Parker's Lake, where Daniel Parker had his homestead. Plymouth's name was handed down by the Hennepin County Commissioners. 
But historians believe that's because there was a, a settlement made at Parker's Lake. The settlement floundered because Parker's Lake flooded and it flooded the main part of the town, which was a grist mill. So they moved that to Wyzetta and the little settlement just disbanded. At that time, the residents, the pioneers around Medicine Lake thought the township should be called Medicine Lake. That two years later changed back to Plymouth and Plymouth Township has been kept the same name for all these years. The story goes that the name Plymouth was chosen because of that settlement. But there are like 30 Plymouths in the United States, so that's obviously an homage to Plymouth Rock. In 1851, there were two treaties with the Dakota, the Traverse des Sioux and the Treaty of Mendota. And this ceded all lands west of the Mississippi to the United States government. The Dakota were supposed to live in a small band of land on the Minnesota River. This forced the Dakota into living a different lifestyle, which led to the Dakota Uprising. After the treaty was signed, all the land west of the Mississippi, including Plymouth, was open for settlement. And so Plymouth saw a great rush of people coming here to claim homesteads. Between 1856 and 1860, uh, that's when all the land patents pretty much were issued for areas out here. Pretty much uh, the rush was on and it, all the land kind of filled up at the same time. Almost all of Plymouth was settled by 1860, um, which meant we had about 80 families living in Plymouth. And by 1870, there were 143 families. And those original settlers were primarily farmers. Uh, they came out and cleared a lot of the land. That's how they paid for some of their properties and such, and, uh, and then uh, became uh, farmers in the area. Wheat was the cash crop. They grew potatoes, they grew onions, they grew carrots. They grew corn for feeding their animals and themselves. There was a hotel that was developed uh, back in the, the 1860s by Nicholas Bofferding, and it was called the Farmer's Home Hotel. And uh, we might know it, it, you might be more familiar with it today also, it's called Sheeby's Hotel or Sheeby's Corner, uh, which is still kind of a landmark in Plymouth. It was located on the roadway system that the farmers used to bring goods on horses and wagons to market in Minneapolis. It was an overnight stop for a lot of farmers who were coming into the hay market and into the produce markets of Minneapolis to sell their goods. So they'd come out the Watertown Road and the Wyzetta Road where they intersected there, that was Sheeby's Corner, and they could overnight there, get up in the morning, go into Minneapolis, set up, sell their goods, and then at the end of the day come back out here before they traveled back home. Railroads were the most important thing for the development of Plymouth. Plymouth benefited from the railroad coming to Wyzetta in 1867. They served the people with all of their needs, brought all the goods that you could use for farming, building barns, they brought lumber, they brought hardware, they brought tools. The biggest thing that brought people to, to Plymouth was the loose line. The Loose Line, in order to build business out here, wanted to make some destination points along the road. They wanted to create a park at Medicine Lake. They wanted to create a park and pavilion at Parker's Lake in Plymouth. They went to Medicine Lake first and, um, and then Parker's Lake uh, within the year. And those were typically a two-car train um, uh, with pa pulling passengers and maybe having a few boxcars to pull freight and things like that. The railroads, they were it. Much like we think of the highways today, the railroads until the 1950s were the main thing. When the citizens of Plymouth first began meeting as a township, they would just meet in various people's homes. And actually the first meeting was so well attended that the home they had selected to meet in was too small to hold all the people. So they had to postpone that first meeting in order to find a bigger house. Plymouth actually didn't get a town hall until 1885. 
The town hall uh, was built by Clem Mendelko, and he decided to build it where it is by just kind of looking at a map and saying, oh, I'm going to build it right in the center of town. And that's where it still is today. Churches in Plymouth started to form um, when different groups of people sort of banded together and said, we need a church. So small congregations would pop up and the, all the townspeople would go to church. In Plymouth, you get this potpourri of all these different people. They were formed by groups of people who had a, sometimes had a common heritage. So St. Joseph's Church was formed for the French Canadian population. Mount Olivet was a German Lutheran church. And so you get the different ethnic groups with their different religious focuses coming. So there was not one dominant group. Whichever faith you were part of was an important part of the community, bringing people together, getting people to know each other, because they, even if they came from the same country, they didn't come from the same town. The churches that the pioneers established first of all, was where they practiced their faith. The church also was a location where a lot of education took place. The country schools back in pioneer times were very simple and very short-lived, and the church was also a major educational part for children. There's two characters involved in this. One is the gentleman, Gil Fillon, who owns Ben Avon Farms which is where the workhouse was located. And the other was Earl Brown, who had the Earl Brown farm up in the Brooklyn Park area. At the time, they were trying to teach people who were struggling, people who were getting arrested for vagrancy, theft, um, drunk and disorderly, give them a place to rehabilitate. And they had a facility set in Camden area of Minneapolis, but it wasn't big enough. So they negotiated to either buy the Earl Brown farm up in Brooklyn Park or the Ben Avon farm down here in Plymouth. And Ben Avon farm was the one that they chose. The workhouse developed a great service to the community. They taught vocational skills, like much like our Hennepin Vocational Colleges teach today. They taught it to the people arrested and incarcerated. So they left with skills they could then get employment with. The Union City Mission started in Minneapolis back in 1895. It was formed out of uh, 13 area churches that got together and wanted to minister to some of the less fortunate people uh, in the communities. But they had such a demand that they decided, well, maybe what we can do is find an area farm and have a start a working farm and rehabilitation program. They brought a bunch of men out here and they put them to work uh, recycling buildings out of Minneapolis. The buildings that they built were quite fascinating. There were eight lodges located on the property. There was a giant tabernacle building that was there that seated up to 2,000 people with it seating for additional 1,000 outside. One of the spectacular buildings uh, that you could stay in was a, a wigwam that was three stories tall that acted as kind of a dormitory structure for people. Uh, they say over between the years 1930s to 19, early 1960s in its heyday, uh, more than a million people stayed out at Medicine Lake. As a teenager, I started working for Mission Farms. They had all these conventions in the summers. I worked in the men's section the building, and, uh, and eventually we, they had a woman's building. And Mission Farms took the people that weren't the ones that were arrested, but the ones that were just needed help. And they were actually, the Mission Farms helped create the Minnesota program of rehabbing alcohol, drug-related, and other mental health issues. Mission Farms was the place that did that. It became known far and wide for its style of rehabilitation and became a drawing point for people to come who needed this kind of help. They knew Mission Farms was a place that when people needed somewhere to go to get themselves back on track in life, 
this was a good facility. It was the original starting point for things like Hazel, Hazelden got their start from the style of rehab that was done at, at Mission Farm. So you can sort of say they were the, they were the seed for the rehabilitation programs in Minnesota. All these other towns were trying to steal Plymouth's borders and Medicine Lake contributed to that because they seceded from Plymouth and created their own town right in the middle of the township borders. The town of Plymouth became nervous that their town would go away. In 1955, Plymouth voted to become a village instead of a township, which it had been since 1858. So the reason for this was because as other towns around Plymouth grew, they started trying to annex different parts of Plymouth. And this was possible because Plymouth was a township. If it was a village, it would be able to preserve its own land. Lashibi's family uh, over time had a hotel and they built a shopping center in the 50s and that became the commercial area. Lashibi's store was the first business that I, I knew out that west of Minneapolis. And that family had long roots going back to the previous century in, in owning property and developing and farming uh, and were active up until the 80s uh, with that, uh, that shopping center. Shebe's covered three important aspects of Plymouth. Gustav Shebe came to Plymouth and Gustav was the one that, that acquired the, the farmer's home hotel and eventually Henry bought farm where the Honeywell plant is on 55 and that was the home farm. Henry bought a farm truck in 1925, the one ton Model T farm truck. And it's still used for the Plymouth Parade every year. Henry's son Harvey wasn't so interested in farming. So Harvey started the hardware store, which was there on 55 and the little, the, the first real retail development in Plymouth. And he ran the hardware store for many, many years. Plymouth, uh, many years ago, had this industrial park. It really um, set the tone and the base for Plymouth. A gentleman who was from North Minneapolis, who developed a business of providing trading stamps to grocery stores to provide loyalty in customers. And the gentleman's name was Curtis Carlson. Kurt Carlson established what was called the Gold Bond Company, Gold Bond Stamps, located in, in Plymouth back in the 60s. He had acquired a good deal of property in that general area at the inter, around the intersection of 55 and um, 490, what is today 494. He uh, was able to develop his industrial park, which he called the Minneapolis Industrial Park. Minneapolis Industrial Park was one of the greatest changes in Plymouth history. He developed more and more of the property and gained the wealth to become, in his era, one of the wealthiest men in the state of Minnesota. Loring Staples was one of the people who helped, again, recognizing that the uh, development was inevitable, started to do the, uh, hire people to do the initial planning that resulted in the development of the city. My vision was that we'd be a, a balanced community. We, we, we felt that we needed strong administration to carry out uh, the, the uh, aggressive improvements that we had in mind. Al Hildy was the, the mayor. He came to become mayor, I think, in 1968, elected primarily because of his um, dissatisfaction with some of the planning and execution of original plans and discussions about how sewer should be extended. When I took office, uh, the, all the city sewage ran through a pipe about this big, about six inch diameter. And uh, so that had to be corrected immediately uh, before we could have any dreams of uh, serious development. The city council developed a, um, a comprehensive plan that they adopted that developed the framework, sanitary sewers, master plan, if you will, of where the main, main big lines went. 
Plymouth decided they were going to put in sewer and water. Unfortunately, it pushed farmers off their farmland. As that development took place, the private sector building homes, it obviously eroded the agricultural base. I had meetings in the kitchen of farmers' homes. I wanted to get them on a better track than they were on. The city, through its working with its engineers, uh, were able to develop a, a sanitary sewer system that took advantage of a, uh, a sewer interceptor pipe in the city of Golden Valley. That provided the, the, the backbone that we needed to extend sewers throughout the rest of the city. School districts started in Minnesota with one-room schools, much like the size of the Plymouth Historical Society building. The first recorded uh, school in the area was in 1855, and it was a uh, one-room log school in, on the grounds of the Wyzetta Country Club. Plymouth's first school was called District 95. Uh, schools weren't named like we name them today, they were named for the district. I went to school, District 95, it was a one-room school. All eight grades in the one room. The kids were anywhere from, from six to 20 because it was a place to go to learn how to read, how to write, and how to do what used to be called ciphering, which is the old-fashioned term for math. Historically, the school districts were established, their boundaries were established long before the city of Plymouth became a city, it was a township. And the school district boundaries generally followed agricultural properties. The whole formation of the boundaries of the school district, and for that matter, cities, uh, doesn't please anybody that likes orderly things, because they, they do really, if you think about it, go back to original farmland boundaries. The districts were funded principally by property taxes, which is what's led to these crazy boundaries. Because if you were a farmer and you owned land on both sides of a road, no matter where your house was, that land was the property taxes for that school district. So the district property, the district line would come down and take your farm on the east side of the road and take your land on the west side of the road. So the line would zigzag around. And to this day, it drives developers crazy because wherever you are in Plymouth, you'd have no idea what school district you're going to be in. The two dominant districts in the early days were Robinsdale School District, which took in the eastern portion of the city, and the Wyzetta School District, which took in most of the balance of the city. I said I had a high school uh, beginning in the early 1900s. The first graduating class from Wyzetta High School was 1906. Wyzetta was the only high school uh, in the area, so people from the, the Plymouth area and, and Long Lake uh, all came to Wyzetta. In 1946, the state of Minnesota had thousands of school districts, independent schools that were all operating separately. But the state decided that the cities and townships should merge those school districts together. And Plymouth at that time decided not to have its own school district. Most of Plymouth went with the Wyzetta High School. Some went to Osseo High School because there was a high school there and some went to Robbinsdale High School. I hear a lot of people say, wow, you've got that great connection with the neighbors and the residents being associated with the school, whether it's, we have four school districts, so whatever school district it is, it really brings a sense of community and a sense of pride. I'm very proud to have been part of the school district for a number of years, but I continue to be proud of where it stands. And We were always doing surveys. Every other year we had a consultant come in and survey the population of the different things that they were looking for for a quality of life in Plymouth. And parks and trails uh, came back as a very significant factor in what people were choosing. We did a master plan that we started in 1980, took about a year and a half, and was officially adopted in February of 1982. 
and that was the guiding light for building the park and trail system. And virtually everything on that plan has been built. We had um, great vision in our community where they wanted to make sure that land was set aside continuously as we developed because Plymouth was a very fast growing community. It still is growing fast. And so we had leaders within our park system and within the city that felt it was important to make sure land was set aside. There's a state law that allows for park dedication, okay, as development takes place. And the city had a philosophy that all new development paid its own way. That meant that a new housing development paid for the streets, they paid for the sewer, and they paid for the waters. But they also chipped in for parks. And so 90% of all the funding of parks came through that system. Putting a park system in place takes a lot. It's the open space, it's the places, the play fields, it's the small neighborhood parks where people can play, it's the larger parks um, that we have throughout, you know, attached to the lakes in our community. So it really takes a lot of planning and diversity to make sure that we have something that kind of meets the needs of everybody. We were looking for places that had trees, hills, streams, wetlands. Water adds an immense amount to every park. We're very fortunate to have two very large lakes where you can recreate on them. Uh, Medicine Lake is the second largest lake in Hennepin County and so we've really capitalized on that. We have over 150 miles of trails throughout our community and I think that's really helpful too for people um, if they want to do, you know, put their kids in the bike on their bikes and get to the library or go to one of the parks. We've really tried to make sure they can get around Plymouth and not be tied to a car. It's become a, a major component of our system and, and it's obviously very, very popular. We built larger athletic facilities, so rather than having one baseball field like a neighborhood park, we would build parks where there'd be five baseball fields, five soccer fields, and we would put them at major intersections, Zachary Park being at the corner of Zachary Lane and County Road 9, so it didn't go into the neighborhood. The, na the noise and the activity and the lights were kept at a major intersection. And the city parks were meant to be larger facilities that were attractive to the entire community. So Plymouth Creek Park being the largest central park, Bass Lake, East and West Med Park. So that was the strategy of the park system when it, when it was rolled out. The playfields, four of the six original playfields were on school district property. We partnered with the school districts to site parks that serve both the elementary schools or the middle schools and the city park department. Having a partnership like that, you know, when again land is very expensive to buy, when they already own property at their facilities and we were able to, to, to work the deals where we could negotiate long-term leases. And it was important to negotiate a long-term lease because if you're going to spend a million dollars on a facility, you don't want the people that you're leasing it from to ask you to leave after two or three years. We had one of the largest, if not the largest, youth hockey association in the country. And so the, the demand for ice time was immense at that particular time. And the community center and the deal with Lifetime was very unique. That was the first public-private partnership done in America. The Lifetime Fitness Center was a joint venture between the city uh, and the school district and Lifetime Fitness. We actually approached Lifetime Fitness for their deal. And the community really liked that idea of being in a public-private partnership uh, where the heavy athletics uh, would be done by a private entrepreneur. When that was being constructed, we had people at the city that had the foresight to say, let's, let's use this as a community pool and let's have the, the high school use this as their swim, for their swim meets. And so that partnership was forged and I think it was a great example of a community and a private enterprise coming together to make something work. It was a synergistic type of thing where everybody came together and you were able to develop something that I don't think any one of the parties could have done on their own. Lifetime attracts a million visits a year to go through the doors of Lifetime and the Ice Center is doing 450,000 so you have almost one and a half million visits coming to that one facility in the downtown and so the restaurants, the grocery stores, the hairstylists, all of those businesses, the gas stations, have reaped the benefit of having a million and a half people coming in and out every year annually to that facility. It's worked far, far above my expectations. Uh, I've been so pleased by the deal. 
Well, we've had a great partnership with Three Rivers. Our loose line trail system is amazing. It's a great structure in place. It's safe, it gets you off the road. Three Rivers has really put a lot of time and energy into keeping that maintained. French was uh, quite a leader of their park uh, uh, development. I mean, Medicine Lake is today a hundred times more than it was. And the regional parks that they have, um, like um, at uh, Medicine Lake, um, French Park is there, and they really investing into those larger area, larger structures and larger amenities in our community has really been a bonus for us. That was always the goal to have the park system done when the housing was completed in the community and, and seems to be matching up quite well. So the major facilities, the lifetime facility, the ice center, the field house, the community center, those were the major facilities that were shown in the comprehensive plan. We're very fortunate to have Plymouth Creek Center in Plymouth. We built this amazing facility and it's changed a lot. It started out as our seniors wanted a place where they could get together and have events. The community center was an interesting one because we had a large contingent of seniors meeting all over town in churches and other venues. They were the ones and the voices uh, that were talking to the council saying, the seniors wanted to have a uniform program and a series of programs that would unite them in the community. And so the development of the community center, um, again, really was a genesis of the seniors and, and their voice in the community of wanting to be a part of the community. And then we started to see our residents say, well, we want, we'd like to see this. We wanted a garden and we wanted a little theater there and we wanted space for rehearsals and we wanted more sports space. I'm excited that as our community is growing, we can still meet their needs and, and bring in um, new infrastructure to support what their wants and needs are. We were always partnering with the Plymouth Civic League and Music in Plymouth is the one that everybody knows. They may not know that the Plymouth Civic League put on a winter event and it was called Skiing in Plymouth. And it was done, it was a three, 5K race done right here in Plymouth Creek Park and it never took off. We went through all of the 80s, tried to build it up, and we would get 100 people. All that work and effort for 100 people probably wasn't hitting the chord that we were looking for. So we abandoned that idea and switched to Old Fashioned Christmas as a joint project with the Historical Society. And Old Fashioned Christmas uh, really took off. And then we built on that, we then went to um, Fire and Ice. Created the Fire and Ice Festival on the lake, a wintertime event to replace the skiing event. And that has been, from day one, a tremendous success. Everybody enjoyed that. It had the ending that Music and Plummet had, fireworks. And that was uh, the biggest one that we had success with. We're very fortunate to have our Hildy Performance Center in Plymouth, very generously donated by a former mayor. The Hildy Performance Center came about because Al Hildy um, wanted to um, do something for the community. We, we love this place and uh, had an affection for it and wanted the best thing to, to happen for it. And he donated uh, just over a million dollars to the city to get that project built and it is named after him, the Hildy Performance Center, after he and his wife. When we got out here and, and we saw the beautiful nature that was available to develop and to be in the orchestra and, the, and this environment could really go together quite well. But he wanted to develop something that would um, support and enhance music in Plymouth. And music in Plymouth it was an event that was started back in uh, 72, three, by Al Hildy and Kurt Carlson, bringing the Minnesota Orchestra out to Plymouth for a free concert. We had the first Minneapolis uh, symphony uh, performance right in the middle of MIP. I can still remember uh, wandering around in the very back of the audience area, just looking at the whole scene and and wondering where we could go from here, and that uh, this is certainly a humble beginning. And that 
event had grown over the years and he thought it would be great if we could build an amphitheater that would host the Minnesota Orchestra. We have always had music in Plymouth. It's been in Plymouth for over 45 years. It used to be in a parking lot. Then we had a portable stage. And when we had Al Hildy donate to build this amphitheater, we thought, how can we make this the hub and the center of our community? What can we do? Of course, it was built for music in Plymouth. That was Al's intention, is to have a permanent place for music in Plymouth. We have this amazing facility. Let's not just use it for one awesome event each year. What else can we do? We had um, council members that said, what about a paid concert and let's bring in a promoter. And so we've had some really big acts from the Goo Goo Dolls to Cheap Tricks to Martin Zeller, um, Big Head Todd came. And so that really has kind of um, brought the amphitheater, the Hildy Performance Center more into the, into the limelight. It's really fun to see how we have this, you know, kind of this performance center built for a specific event, but we've really seen it grow into something that is just kind of a jewel and is a little bit unique, I think, to the, within the community surrounding us. The addition of our Veterans Memorial, I think, has really added to the space, too, where that might be a draw for additional people that might not have come to see any other event there, but then they come to the Veterans Memorial and say, whoa, there's this whole other space out there. When I came to the city in 1971, the industrial park was pretty well developed, continued to develop primarily some light manufacturing and distribution that serve that western uh, Hennepin County area and to some degree the metropolitan area. Lytton came to town and, uh, and uh, had a big factory there in Plymouth just on the Xenium Lane in County Road 6 and that's where they built their microwave ovens and, which is a new product and this was in the early 70s. It was a tremendous boom, one in employment and secondly the the product that uh, was being constructed and manufactured there was very popular. So it, that building and that operation grew substantially over the number of years. One of my favorites is the Lytton Microwave Corporation built this expansive facility there to produce the Lytton Microwave Oven, which was the first really popular microwave oven. Cost hundreds of dollars to have and it was a leading technology and they needed lots of space and they did very well. The Honeyville development was right next to the Shibi Shopping Center. That's where their property is located. They have a research and development arm back there. They did a lot of defense work. They were a major employer, but they also had another factory in town where they made their thermostats for home, home consumption. So they were one of the, the earlier businesses. We do have a very strong um, manufacturing, um, a lot of R&D, a lot of um, big headquarters are located here in Plymouth. Starting in the um, late, mid to late 90s, uh, it was medical. Medical arts companies that have come into town, Medtronic is some activity. We've really started to see the emergence um, of MedTech really building up in Plymouth. I think it really started with St. Jude Medical having its headquarters here. And really when Smith's Medical came about four or five years ago and brought their headquarters here, we really started to see a lot of growth. There are a number of medical businesses that now make Plymouth either home or have facilities here. And as a result of that, um, they provide many, many jobs. Today there are about 50,000 jobs created throughout the city. The original plan that goes back to 1969, 70, was to, through land use planning, there was a one area that was thought to be de desirable for commercial development, uh, and that was, became known as downtown Plymouth. And that generally is in the area where the city hall is today. Uh, it's Vicksburg Lane, Highway 55, and slightly north. I started with the concept of downtown Plymouth, and people used to laugh about that. They couldn't imagine a downtown in Plymouth, but I did, and uh, a post office, a library, significant shopping opportunities. I've always wanted Plymouth to have 
this great downtown area that Wyzata might have or that Edina has, and we, we don't have that. And so we've had to be creative and kind of build that in within our neighborhoods and within our schools. And we still have a downtown city center area that I love, and it has some amenities to it. For a while, I think Plymouth did not have a lot of diversity. I'd say back in the, probably the late 80s, early 90s. And, but that has significantly changed. We started seeing a lot of Indians, Pakistani, Middle Eastern people coming into Plymouth. Our Indian community has grown substantially and I've, we've had the opportunity to attend some of their events as elected officials and they're so enthusiastic about Plymouth. They love Plymouth. Go to music in Plymouth or any events down there around the Plymouth Civic Center and the Hilde Performance Center. It's amazing how you can see the diversity of the little kids on their tricycles and moms and dads. It's, I mean, it's a great thing. It makes me very, very happy. Money Magazine annually selected the city's the best place to live. In 2008, we were the number one city by Money Magazine, which is something we're super proud of. I think it largely was because of the development of the, um, the neighborhoods that we had, nice neighborhoods, good school districts, and our parks and recreation system. I think it recognized the hard work of previous city councils and city staffs and the community people to develop the sense of community which is so important to the present Plymouth identity. We're starting to see changes come forth and then of course redevelopment is going to be a big issue going forward for Plymouth. We see um, just a lot of changes. Our Plymouth, you know, people don't realize you have one part of your community that's fairly new and is still growing like gangbusters and then there are older parts of Plymouth as well, you know, kind of on the east side of Plymouth that really have kind of aged out of the strip mall and we've seen some great redevelopment there, but there's still more to come. Plymouth is reaching its maturity in terms of new development mm -hmm. and so we're now confronting and starting to plan for the necessity to redevelopment and to recycle land or buildings or areas uh, and to perhaps other uses. We really need to keep changing and growing as our community changes. I think our community is ready for that, especially the Four Seasons Mall area. We're anxiously awaiting for something to happen there. That's just a strip mall that's aged out and we're you know, looking hard to really make sure we can put something there that meets the needs of our community. I'm just extremely proud of what the city has become and it's because elected officials have worked together effectively amongst themselves with the city staff, with the community members at large, uh, everybody working together to make the community someplace that people want to live and raise a family.